It's an honor to be joined today by Dr. Willem Frankenhaus. He's an associate professor of evolutionary and population biology at the University of Amsterdam, a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Crime, Security, and Law, and director of the research network on communicating strength-based approaches to child development and learning in adverse conditions. He studies how cognition and behavior develop in harsh and unpredictable conditions. His empirical work focuses on hidden talents, abilities that are enhanced by adversity, and reasonable responses, behavior that can be understood as a response to the costs and benefits faced by people living in poverty. His theoretical work uses mathematical modeling to explore the evolution and development of plasticity, the ability to adjust development to different environmental conditions. Willem, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really like the idea of developmental plasticity. Maybe we could start on the theoretical end and then move to your more practical empirical work. So first, what type of plasticity are we talking about? Yeah, well, so in psychology, you know, people will distinguish between brain plasticity and cognitive plasticity and behavioral plasticity. And, 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 and each of those refers to the ability of an organism to adjust its brain or cognition or behavior in response to its experiences, to, to the environmental inputs it's receiving or inputs of its internal state. Um, in biology, people also look at all three of those levels, but they will often use sort of one term and it's the term phenotypic plasticity to capture, um, you know, plasticity in general. Uh, and so, um, Plasticity is really at the root of all the work that I'm doing, both theoretically and empirically. And then within the study of plasticity, I tend to focus on forms of plasticity that are, are adaptive. And that means that the plastic response to, to the experiences, to the environmental conditions has been shaped by a process of natural selection in the past. Um, so there might also be responses of organisms to current conditions where they alter their phenotype or you know, their body or their brain. Uh, or their cognition in a way that is not adaptive. Um, and that's not primarily my focus. What's an example of a not adaptive adaptation? Yeah. So for example, imagine if an organism is exposed to a novel toxin in its environment and its body is, you know, responding to this toxin in a way that is having maybe an enduring impact. Um, but it's not a response that in the past has increased survival and reproduction in the lineage of this organism, then you would say the organism is showing a response, but it's not a plastic, it's not an adaptively plastic response. In evolutionary biology and psychology, sometimes you have this idea of spandrels where something evolves for some reason, or maybe not even for a reason, it's kind of like a byproduct of something else, but you can tell an interesting evolutionary story. One that I caught myself doing recently, this was doing some research on how hormones affects different types of reward motivation. And I learned that estradiol in females is positively associated with sex drive and progesterone with food drive. So right before ovulation, estradiol peaks and sex drive is at its highest and food drive is low. And then post ovulation, estradiol dips, sex drive plummets, and you get food cravings. And people see this in humans anecdotally across the menstrual cycle, and there's been experimental rodent research looking at this as well. And the sex drive peaking before ovulation makes perfect sense. That's when you want to mate. And the food drive peaking afterwards also makes sense because you either want to recover energy for mating or store energy for pregnancy. And I was also thinking, oh, if food drive dips while sex drive dips, maybe this could be because in humans, at least, you want to look skinny and attractive and in, in Western culture, like that's what's seen as most attractive. So this is going to help you catch a mate. And almost immediately I realized, wait, this skinny is attractive thing is unique to a specific time and place in human history. And even if it was universal across humans, doesn't really make sense in other animals. So that was an example of say a spandrel climbing where I almost caught myself doing bad evolutionary psychology there. So how do you tease apart whether something is genuinely adaptive or when it's something like a theory that might make sense in principle, but you can't exactly test it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question that the field 
you know, is grappling with um, already for, for many decades in, since, in, since its inception. Um, and, and, and then, of course, the Spandrels, um, you know, paper um, has really put this discussion front and center for a long time, and it's, it's always ongoing. Um, and you mentioned taking, you know, a cross-cultural approach and taking a comparative approach of comparing humans to, 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 to non-human animals. And, and those are two of the tools in our toolkits for trying to disambiguate. Um, now, when we use those tools, we do need to be sort of careful about our preconceptions because there are people who think that if something is, for example, adaptive, then it must be universal in the species, for example. So then they want to do cross-cultural research to see whether it is universal in the species and use, you know, that as, as evidence for or against it being an adaptation. But of course, adaptations do not also need to be universal in, in the human species. Uh, and similarly with comparative work, um, if you see that in other animals than humans, there is a similar response. It's, it's maybe more likely that um, it could be adaptive, but it's also the case that there are human unique adaptations. And so if it's not present in these other animals, it could still be the case that it is an adaptation. So, so yes, those two tools are, are very good to, uh, to use. And they're also, it's also very interesting to just understand variation across the various levels of analysis. Um, the question of how to establish whether something, you know, is an adaptation, uh, there, there are multiple different approaches that people take to this. So um, in evolutionary, you know, biology with short-lived organisms that have, you know, short generation times, people sometimes use a paradigm called experimental evolution. And, and what they do in experimental evolution is they split, you know, a population of organisms into two groups and they expose one of those groups to a different set of selection pressures than the other part of the group. And if generations take only three days, then, you know, after a few hundred days, you've had many generations and then you can see whether animals have evolved, you know, according to the environmental conditions uh, that, that your hypothesis um, said should lead to the adaptation. So that's one paradigm that people use. In other cases, people might, not do experimental evolution because it's not feasible, for example, or not ethical. And then people might say, well, I think, you know, uh, trait X is adaptive. And then they look at whether there are associations between trait X and reproductive success or survival. Um, when survival and reproductive success are good measures of fitness, um, is actually a complicated area of research in, in biology. Um, and so, it depends on, in part on the extent to which currently the population is growing or shrinking, for example, whether, you know, taking kind of the individual organisms, survival and reproductive success, whether to take that as a proxy for how good a strategy is. Um, and so this is really a hard and complicated topic. But I think what's most important is that uh, we do what you just did, which is that we ask these questions of ourselves. And then when we are considering a particular adaptive hypothesis, we are going to, um, you know, reflect in this particular case, which measures would be well suited to the research question. Your work studies sort of the paradoxical response, because when, when you say adversity, almost immediately, it has these sort of negative connotations, but then this hidden talents research, it sounds almost like there are some features of human cognition or behavior that are only unlock if you're exposed to a certain level of adversity. Is that a right way to frame it? So the, the way I think about it is that, you know, adversity in, 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 in the way I use it refers to prolonged exposures to in, intensely stressful conditions. Okay. So, so we're not talking about somebody who once on the subway, um, you know, feels threatened or something like that. We're talking about people who are, for instance, growing up in a neighborhood where they feel threatened often, or people who are growing up in a household where, you know, things are very stressful, maybe because of violence in the household, but it could also be because there is economic hardship or food insecurity or, you know, psychopathology in the family that's creating a lot of distress. So there could be many reasons for, for adversity and adversity is, is really negative for people's well-being. It's bad. It's, 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 you know, it's 
it's detrimental to people's health and well-being when they grow up in adverse conditions. And so um, as a society, we should do as much as we can to reduce adversity. And I, if we can, eliminate it. However, in practice, there will always be, unfortunately, people exposed to adversity. And um, it's important to understand their developmental responses to those conditions. And the predominant view in psychology and the social sciences more generally has been to emphasize <clears throat> kind of the, 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 you know, not only the struggles that people who are living in adverse conditions are going through, but also the ways in which it can kind of harm their performance on a variety of um, kind of standardized tests that are used in education or in psychology more generally. So cognitive tests, for example. And so one of the predominant ways that people look at this in the psychological sciences is they is through kind of models of toxic stress. And those say, if you are experiencing, you know, chronic stress, um, this can, it doesn't do this for everyone, but it increases the chances of um, impairments in brain structure and function, which are then reflected in lower test scores on a wide variety of tests. So that's my summary of the predominant view in, in the psychological sciences. And what I've been trying to do, and with me several other colleagues, <clears throat> is to kind of widen the window on how people respond to adversity to also incorporate adaptive developmental processes. And so when people grow up in conditions of adversity, they are experiencing particular challenges. For example, if you're growing up with threats, you know, it's it, detecting a threat early is a challenge. Responding to a threat once detected is a challenge. And so it's interesting to then reflect on the possibility that people growing up with, for example, threat might, might develop enhanced abilities for dealing with threat. Maybe earlier detection, maybe more accurate detection, maybe less accurate detection because they err on the side of caution and kind of over -int interpret ambiguous signals as being threatening, but then responding to it in a way that is maybe effective for avoiding the threat. And this perspective is a perspective that if you take a developmental plasticity, adaptive developmental plasticity view, it, it comes naturally that you want to think about what are the kind of challenges an individual faces in their environment and what skills or abilities might become enhanced as a result of these exposures. But also, there's work in non-human animals that shows that they, in some cases, develop these hidden talents. So, for example, rodent pups growing up with low levels of licking and grooming are growing up in a world that's harsher and more unpredictable. And they are able to learn faster about dangers in their environment. So they can associate a spatial location more rapidly with danger um, than individuals who've grown up with more licking and grooming, which feels safer. They have you know, a, a less kind of stressed phenotype. And so threat is sort of a very obvious case, but of, for, of course, adversity comes in many forms. What the Hidden Talents Research Program is trying to do is it's trying to say, for a given type of adversity, what are the challenges associated for a particular individual? And so those challenges will be different if you're exposed to violence than if you're exposed to food insecurity than if you're exposed to, uh, you know, neglectful parenting, for example. And what kind of strategies and skills might people develop um, as a way of navigating this difficult situation. Are you working with Kate McLaughlin's threat versus deprivation model of adversity at all? Yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware of that of that model, and um, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's one useful way of of carving up the problem. I think it's not the only way, um, but I think it's an interesting model. Mm -hmm. So that's one that. <clears throat> I've been familiar with in this adversity area is out, outside of my own research area, but um, I'll summarize and, and you could add to it, including adding nuances of, of different models that, that might not be included here. So threat-based forms of adversity would be very active forms of harm. So this could be like physical abuse or actual threats to your physical safety, whereas deprivation would be something like neglect or uh, not having enough food or not having shelter, things like that. And there are different evolutionary predictions or adaptations that you would predict in response to that. So for deprivation, 
Uh, most of my research is on puberty. So for deprivation, well, if you don't have enough calories and you're, you're barely hanging on survival wise, puberty is going to be delayed. That's just seen as extra stuff for, uh, you know, you, you, you can't devote excess energy to, towards reproduction if you are barely hanging on survival wise, but then if you're experiencing threat and assuming you have enough of your basic needs, like calorically puberty actually accelerates. And I think the evolutionary theory there is something like if you are in an unsafe environment, you're likely to die earlier. And if you want to pass your genes on, you better speed up development. As long as you have enough energy to do that, reproduce faster. And then all of this, I guess, connects to life history theory, which we could talk about too, but maybe wrap up that discussion of different types of adversity first. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the threat deprivation is, is, is useful and valid, but, but it's also coarse and coarse is not bad, but coarse also means that within threats and within deprivation, there are, you know, um, different subtypes, uh, which actually pose different challenges, right? So for example, um, imagine that among my peers, there's violence, but I'm sort of just as strong as my peers. Right. Then I have maybe some degree of control in the sense that I might be able to fight back or, you know, I might be able to form coalitions, which can help. So the kind of the adaptive strategies that I might develop in that context of threat might be a bit different than, you know, if I'm, if I'm six and my, and my parent is 20 years older and way stronger and I, and, and I, you know, the, the, I, I can still develop strategies, maybe detecting early, for example, whether um, my parent is showing signals that they are in, in a mood that is more likely to lead to violence for but it's, but, but I cannot really in the same way defend myself as I might be able to do when I'm an adolescent and there are other adolescents who are being violent around me. Um, so that's just to, to give a sense of, you know, I think it's a useful distinction, but I also think it's useful to think about the subtypes below, um, each of those. Mm -hmm. Now <clears throat> you're linking them to the reproductive development. Um, and, and that's something that people have, uh, have done for, for a while and, and People like Jay Belsky and Bruce Ellis and Rebecca Sear and Mary Shank and others have written really interesting, um, both theoretical and empirical, you know, papers on, on, on this topic. It's, it's actually a very complicated topic and, and it's not the sense you would always get when sort of, you know, reading, um, mainstream papers, uh, on this topic, but, but the, um, the ways in which natural selection might shape reproductive responses, you know, developmental re reproductive responses to things like threat and deprivation, um, are not as straightforward as, um, uh, as they might seem. And I I'll try to explain a little bit why, um, I do think that the first thing you said about when women are growing up with inadequate nutrition and they're basically unable to really, you know, uh, grow an additional human while also maintaining, um, you know, uh, you know, their own health, um, and survival, uh, then, you know, in, in sort of extreme cases, uh, sometimes the, 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 you know, the, the ovulation even stops, um, in, in, in women for a while. Um, but that's of course a very extreme, uh, case. But in other cases, you know, there are these trade-offs where units invested in this offspring are trading off with units invested into their own health and survival. And so, um, I do think it's, it, it's true that when there's uh, significant food deprivation, um, you might not actually see, uh, uh, this speeding up of, of, of reproductive, uh, uh, development, but food deprivation is, is of course, you know, um, is a bit different than social deprivation, for example. So there might be. A woman who is receiving adequate nutrition, but you know, socially she's not in a very rich environment. Um, so will that have the same effect or will that have a different effect? So this is again, to kind of highlight the, the, the useful, the usefulness to me of making these distinctions. Now, in terms of what, for example, high mortality in the environment should do to reproductive development, the intuition, you summarized it very well. Um, and this is, a, this is very commonly stated in the literature and actually in some of my own papers, especially the earlier ones, I have sort of written about it in this way, but I later came to understand that in evolutionary biology, people think about this, um, in a, in a different way, in a way that is much more complicated. And, and so the intuition is that if you might, you know, if you're in an environment where, um, 
you know, you're more likely to die relatively young because there's, for instance, high violence. Um, then it's adaptive to accelerate your reproductive development and, 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 and mature early and, and have babies at a young age so that at least you would have reproduced before you, um, you know, before you might die. And so, but one of the, so that's very much thought at the level of the individual. But if you think about what's happening in a population, it's, it's more complicated and, and I'll, I'll give you one intuition for why that's the case. Imagine that mortality is at a certain level and now mortality goes down. Okay, so mortality rates are going down and so we're more likely to survive. So now this argument should say that we should kind of slow down our reproductive development, right? Because we're in a, an environment with lower mortality rates. That's what the, the intuition would be. But if mortality goes down, what also tends to happen is that populations tend to grow. Populations become bigger. And when populations become bigger, when there's population growth, offspring produced earlier provide greater fitness benefits for a lineage than offspring produced later. It's like investing in a growing economy or investing in a startup. And it's because those early produced offspring will also contribute offspring, which will, in this growing population, produce offspring. Okay. And so once you start thinking at the population level, and this is the level that people use when they make mathematical models of these processes, it becomes actually, you know, quite, quite interesting to look at, okay, so this benefit of earlier reproduction before dying is in some sense, um, you know, it's related to whether the population is growing or shrinking. So what's the force of each of these processes? Uh, and that will determine how natural selection will shape the developmental response of the organism. And um, there's a beautiful paper. It's one of my favorite papers of the last year or so <clears throat> by um, Lotte de Vries, um, I think Hanna Coco, and then Matthias Galipo. I think those are the three authors. And um, it's, it's sort of a guide for the perplexed on this topic. And it's explaining, and they're saying, look, if mortality increases, reproductive development might, in, you know, might accelerate, decelerate, or nothing might happen at all. And we're going to explain to you why that's the case and in which conditions we would expect each response. And it's a beautiful paper. It's very clear. And it's very helpful for people like me because these are people who have deeply studied also the math that's underneath these models. And um, I've studied the math to some, to some extent, but not as deeply as they did. And so what this paper is doing is it's helping people like me and hopefully some of the people in the audience um, to really more deeply understand um, how these processes are working. Does that happen for other behaviors as well? Uh, so not just towards reproductive success, but say towards risk-taking in general? We could introduce life history theory here. I see. Yeah, so yes, um, in, in, in the following sense. So there are powerful intuitions in the literature about uh, in environments that are, people will say, for example, like harsh or unpredictable, then it's adaptive to take more or less risk or to become more or less present oriented, right? <clears throat> and it's easy to make kind of an intuitive case for those things. But when you really start unpacking exactly what the claim is, and then you start formalizing the process in a model, uh, the model might not always give the same answer as the intuition uh, does. And, and so... For something like, um, you know, harshness and unpredictability, both of those notions are, um, are, are broadly useful, but they are also ambiguous. So let me take the notion of unpredictability because that's a topic that we've also worked on. <clears throat> there are actually different types of unpredictability that produce different types of selection pressures. So one way of thinking about unpredictability is to think about it as autocorrelation. So sort of the extent to which today predicts tomorrow, or if you're looking at a longer time scale, the extent to which this year's mortality predicts next year's mortality. So that's autocorrelation. But another type of unpredictability is whether there are change points in a time series. So imagine that I have, you know, a thousand measures of something like um, mortality or, or some other factor in the environment. And 
there are going to be fluctuations around some average. Now imagine that suddenly there's a drop or an increase, and now the time series continues at a higher or lower level, right? That kind of steeper drop or increase, um, that's a particular type of unpredictability that's not well captured by autocorrelation. So people use change points to capture that. Now, those are just, you know, two types of unpredictability. Actually, there are about seven or eight. Um, and, 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 and so we've, we've discussed those in some of our work. Another critical issue when you're talking about unpredictability is, are you talking about spatial or temporal unpredictability? So do I know based on where I'm currently at, if I go over, you know, uh, some distance um, to the left or the right, what the environment's going to be there, like there, so that's spatial? Or am I talking about, you know, through time? And sometimes people lump these things together. So they'll say unpredictability refers to, um, you know, uh, variation across space and time. But actually, spatial variation and temporal variation create different challenges for organisms, right? And also, variation doesn't have to be unpredictable. Seasons imply variation, but they are predictable. So then people will say, okay, so it's like probabilistic or stochastic variation across space and time or across space or time. Well, on what time scale are we talking about if we're talking about time? Are we talking about unpredictable from minute, one minute to the next or from one year to the next? And so, <clears throat> so sometimes it's okay to use this language um, when we're kind of trying to capture, you know, broad, broad concepts or broad ideas, but really when we're really making adaptive arguments, we need to, we need to be more specific. And then, and then those verbal claims are, are in my view, um, you know, are too imprecise. And to really evaluate the claim, we need to make it precise and we can do that using modeling. We can also do it using, you know, language, using natural language, but it's going to take some, some effort. And then we can really study, okay, so then if the world is exactly in that particular way, what's the adaptive response? Are you familiar with Carl Friston's work on active inference? I've come across it, but I'm by no means an expert in it. And oh, so neither I'll I. Ask on the topic, <laughs> but I, I, I know that it's a, it's a big topic. Um, it's this big computational theory of consciousness, a predictive processing theory. And the basic idea is the brain is constantly making predictions and you can quantify prediction error in terms of entropy. And entropy can also be a measure of uncertainty in the environment. So all of this is just like Bayesian statistical analysis and, and a computational framework for what we already knew the brain is doing. Um, but the interesting part for me was he tied it with emotion with a, a, another neuroscientist named Mark Solms. And the idea here is that entropy can explain the evolution of affect essentially. So, so the idea that valence and arousal emerge as a consequence of this entropy monitoring system in the brain. So it starts off with a few axioms. Uh, so one is that we inherently experience high entropy as negative and low entropy as positive. So that's where you get this idea of positive, negative valence. And that arousal would be a, the magnitude of shift, like whether it's a small increase or decrease or a large change in entropy. And there are lots of other basic emotion theories that say emotion affect is really all valence and arousal plus context is when you get differentiation into all the more interesting emotions. So I thought this was a really interesting evolutionary and computational framework for how you go from sort of no subjective experience to getting not only subjective experience in the sense that you have an agent, like who's making decisions in the world, but where you actually get something like affect and this would all, this would all be survivally relevant. So the entropy monitoring, it's not just a matter of wanting to make predictions in the world. It's making predictions for the sake of survival or for the sake of homeostasis. So you could even imagine at the single cellular level, if there's some ability to say track changes in the environment, like in temperature or something, and that can influence homeostatic self-regulation. This was all, uh, Mark Solms wrote a book on this called the hidden spring where he overlays Friston's theories and then connects it to some other philosophy of mind and evolutionary theory. And it's, it's meant to be a grand theory of where emotion comes from and therefore where consciousness comes from. 
Yeah. Yeah, this this sounds quite interesting. Um, and this is a richer description than, um, you know, what I knew about it before you uh, you described it. And what's a common denominator between this way of thinking, sort of this model or approach, and the way that uh, that people think about this in, in kind of evolutionary biology, um, in the modeling work that we are doing, is that we are viewing organisms <clears throat> as creatures who are trying to figure out the statistical and the reward structure of the environment. They're trying to figure out what the structure of the environment is and then respond to that. And um, and I think that, that perspective is very basic, but, but it's quite illuminating. And one of the questions that's also in the literature about how humans might adapt to unpredictable environments is the question, well, how do people then estimate unpredictability? in their environment. And there are sort of two ways that I think people think about this in the literature. One way is kind of like a Q approach. Um, the word Q, Q refers to an observation that provides information about the state of the world. And so there are some people in evolutionary psychology who say, you know, events like, uh, you know, a change uh, in the caregiver or a residential change or, you know, um, somebody, you know, dying in your environment, those things hist across evolutionary time, those types of events predicted that your environment would also change in other ways. And therefore the brain has evolved to use just that observation, almost like a discrete kind of observation, you know, like a change in caregivers or something to use that observation to adjust development, including life history development, like maybe accelerate or decelerate the reproductive development. So here, there's not really much statistical learning occurring. Statistical learning is in some sense has been done already by natural selection in, in that it's shaped the brain in such a way that it's responding to this particular cue um, in, 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 in a sort of a fixed way. But another possibility is that, you know, there, there aren't the specific observations that the brain has been designed to to use to gauge unpredictability um, and to give a lot of weight to, but rather we're trying to build models of our environment and we're using sort of continuous updating about prediction error to try to estimate how well we can currently, you know, uh, adapt to our current environment, how well, uh, how good our estimates are of the current environment. So here there's not any particular kind of evolved cue that we're privileging, but rather we're constantly based on our behaviors and the consequences and the predicted consequences and the discrepancy between what we predicted and what happens. We're trying to use that to build a model of how predictable our world is. Um, and that's maybe then shaping, you know, fee that's maybe then the input to the developmental uh, response. So both of these cases, uh, there's sort of um, the organism is trying to figure out the structure of the world, but in the one case, it's using events that historically had special significance to draw an inference. And in the other case, it's doing sort of continuous model building, like statistical learning um, and, and adapting to that. And those things are not mutually exclusive. So it could also be the case that we are doing this model building, but that we do use certain cues uh, to, uh, to really reshape um, what we believe about the world. And, and when I use words like estimates in, in, in this conversation, by no means do I imply that people are in, in, in a conscious way doing this, in a deliberate way doing this. What I mean is that functionally, that's what the brain is trying to do. The one extreme to the sort of non-conscious active inference that the brain is doing is that are we really making any choices at all? Is this philosophical question of free will underlying all of this? Do you want to go there? Ooh, maybe, maybe not, but I, I do like philosophy. I also studied philosophy and I, I enjoy, you know, I just don't have any special expertise about, about it, uh, but it's certainly uh, of interest, uh, both in, in, in terms of our scientific thinking, as well as in our personal lives. Here's another philosophical question I can throw at you. There are these two almost caricature extremes about human nature. There's Hobbes who has this idea that the natural human state pre-civilization is nasty, brutish, and short. And then there's mm -hmm. Rousseau who has this idea of society is what corrupts humans and in our natural states, like, that brings out our best selves and the truth must be somewhere. 
in the middle of those. But when we're talking about adversity exposure, it's, mm. it's usually framed in more Hobbesian terms, as we were discussing. It's usually framed as adversity is this bad thing that you want to eliminate, even though there are some adaptations that can come out of that. And you had an interesting paper a couple of years ago with Dorsa Amir asking, what is the expected human childhood? So most often in developmental research, you see adversity framed as, as though it's so, some sort of abnormal thing, like relative to an expected safe environment. But if you're thinking about this from an evolutionary perspective, even the chronic forms of stress you were talking about, like constantly feeling under threat in your environment, Unless I just have an overly Hobbesian view, that seems like it was our natural state. The environment was always unpredictable and unsafe. And now we just live in a miraculously safe and fairly predictable environment by any historical comparison. Yeah. So this question, you know, ties in with like gazillion things that I'm extremely interested in and, and, and very happy to, to engage with. And, <clears throat> um, I'm first going to say something terminological because I think it's really important to have clear um, the distinction between adaptive responses and whether something is, you know, positive or negative. And, and I really want to completely separate those two things in, in the following sense. There might be some adaptive responses that actually are... Um, you know, societally viewed or, you know, are, are considered negative uh, by, by many people, but that are nonetheless adaptive. Um, and so, for example, if a child is growing up in a threatening environment and the child is constantly vigilant and its well-being is really suffering, right, that's really negative that the child is feeling so bad. It's very negative. It's feeling negative. The child might also you know, show behaviors that have undesirable consequences for others, like lashing out, but it could be an adaptive response. And so, um, I, I, sometimes people say, and I, and so I, and then I say, well, wait a minute, that's not how I would say it. Sometimes people say, so you study kind of positive adaptations to adversity and then say, I, I don't use the word positive myself. I say, I study adaptations to adversity and whether those are positive or negative, um, that's not something that I, as a scientist can say that's something that we as a society uh, can have views of views about um and um another example would be if I, imagine that i grow up in a world where kind of social dominance is acquired through coercion you know and, and through threatening others to make sure that they don't sort of mess with me that they know i should be feared that i'm that i can be dangerous and now um, i develop a strategy of intimidation that could be a useful strategy in that context, but it's not usually considered socially desirable, um, or at least you know, at least some people in society would not consider it socially desirable when other people are um, are being intimidated, right? So, so this is just some examples. There are also some responses that we would consider, you know, positive, perhaps. So, for example, um, several studies, including some of our own work, have shown that people growing up with more economic hardship show higher levels of empathic accuracy on some tasks. Okay, so being able to kind of understand the internal mental states of other people. That's often considered something, something positive. So that would be a case of potentially an adaptive response to something that's difficult, economic hardship, um, that would also be considered from a societal, societal perspective by many people positive. But, it, but in the research, I tried to really separate those two things. So that's the first thing I wanted to, um, to clarify. <laughs> then regarding um, sort of the ancestral, you know, human um, uh, uh, world, um, what Dorsa and I have argued in the paper is um, not so much that it was one or the other most of the time, but actually that, you know, our lineage is, have, has been exposed to both. And so because our lineage has been exposed to both, what you would expect is phenotypic plasticity, the ability to adjust to either these conditions of maybe, you know, unpredictability and harshness and these conditions of stability and safety. And so, um, so what I think has evolved is the ability to adjust to those different circumstances. And um, 
And I think therefore that the idea that humans are either more, you know, that humans are either good or bad. I remember at some point I came across a symposium where the question was like, sort of, are humans, you know, intrinsically kind of good or bad? And I just thought, I just think that question is not really the right question because I think we have the ability to adjust to both of those things. And um, I think in almost every human, um, you know, uh, there are the potentials for doing good things and doing, get, and, and doing bad things. And it will depend on a lot of factors uh, in their personal lives and their environments and what other people around them are doing, uh, whether they show one or the other. So then the more interesting question becomes, which conditions lead to behaviors or cognitions that we consider maybe desirable and which ones not? Um, yeah, so that would be uh, the thing I would say about this. It certainly is the case in our paper uh, that we do make the point, and you mentioned this as well, that there are preconceptions in developmental psychology about what human life was like most of the time over evolutionary history that are um, not anchored in empirical research that has studied this topic for decades. So in evolutionary anthropology, you know, history and other fields, people have studied what were conditions like for our ancestors? You know, what, what, what was mortality like at different ages? What were the sources of mortality? Um, people, you know, infer these things based on many sources of evidence. Sometimes people use, you know, kind of, you know, biological materials of humans, like human remains to infer things about did this individual die of disease or violence or, you know, old age. Um, sometimes people use sources of evidence like the, looking at societies that are um, that have not yet undergone uh, an, an industrial uh, kind of revolution or that might, 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 might not go, undergo an industrial revolution. Now, those societies are not, and I say this uh, empathically, they are not a window onto the past. Those societies have changed also since then, and there are many things that might be different between those societies and, 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 um, and the human kind of hunter-gatherer ancestral uh, societies, but they do provide a source of information. And so what we're doing in the paper is we take these different sources of information, bioarchaeology, human history, people have done demographic modeling to look at how the population size increased and decreased through time to draw inferences about mortality. Um, and then we syn syn synthesize this evidence and we're using data sets like Our World in Data and the Human Mortality Database. Um, and those are data sets that are very nice to uh, to study also for people maybe uh, here listening to the podcast because a lot of the data you can you can access um and there are many lessons to be learned there and it's certainly um problematic in my view when people in the developmental psychology literature say things like you know exposure to for instance like low levels of caregiving or um you know high levels of violence falls outside the scope of the expected human childhood. Now, the expected human childhood is a bit of a nebulous concept because in the literature, there are different definitions of this concept. Um, so one definition is that it's something like, you know, um, the kinds of experiences that, um, you know, human children would have typically had over the course of human history. Um, sometimes people have used the phrase like the phylogenetic norm. Now, I think human children have had very different experiences um, in different times and places. So I think it's quite difficult to talk about the, the typical experience, but rather I'd say like, what's the typical, you know, range uh, or what's, what's the range of experiences? And it's been very broad. At least that's what Dorsa and I argue. But it is the case that exposure to mortality and other forms of adversity um, you know, occurred uh, regularly. And we know this because we know, for example, the infant and child mortality were much higher than they are in contemporary industrialized societies on average. Um, and so I can also explain how we know this. But what that means, for instance, is that if you were a child growing up, historically, it's very likely that in your peer group or your siblings, there would be deaths. And so those deaths would have been difficult to deal with. You know, if, if one of your friends dies or one of your siblings dies, um, you know, 
all across the world, people will find that a difficult experience. And, and so, so to acknowledge that that's been what human life was like, I think is, is important. It's important from an empirical perspective. It's also important for what people believe could lead to psychopathology. So for example, one idea in the literature is that if people have experiences that fall outside of sort of the species typical range, it puts them at increased risk of psychopathology. Okay. And some people have even said we should define adversity as experiences that are negative, that are difficult to deal with for individuals and that are outside of the species typical range. Now, experiencing sibling and peer deaths is within the species typical range. That is an experience that many children would have had over evolutionary time. I would argue most children. And so I would still want to call that adversity because it's very difficult to deal with and it leads to stress and sadness and it can lead to those things in a prolonged way. And I would not want to say, well, because this was species typical, I don't want to put the label adversity on it. So I think we should not incorporate this expected childhood notion into our definition of adversity. I think we should study what the expected human childhood was like as a range, because it provides us information about the kinds of experiences that we might expect humans to have evolved developmental adaptations to. Ooh, there's still this caricature of why do we imagine our ancestral environment as running around being chased by lions or uh, living in extreme adversity all the time? So, so in, 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 in my work, there's not that caricature. Um, right. So when I say we, I don't, I don't mean you, I don't even mean scientists. It's just like a thing in popular culture. I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't really have, um, m maybe, yeah, maybe it's, you know, I don't, I don't know what exactly what beliefs are underlying, um, underlying this. I, I, I think that if you ask what people have in their heads about this, I, I think people, there are some people who have this Hobbesian idea in their head, like you just described, but I think there are also many people who have this more Rousseauian idea in their head, like before there was, you know, industrialization and before there were all these technologies that are around now, people lived sort of in harmony, you know, with, with nature and with each other. And so I think both intuitions exist in popular culture. Um, and I don't know if one of those two, um, is more prevalent than the other. On the more anti rousseauian side in, in my department is Steven Pinker, who wrote a book called Enlightenment Now, talking about since the Enlightenment, or especially during the Industrial Revolution, all of these revolutions that have happened in terms of uh, life expectancy and food availability and education and disease rates going down and all of that. And again, he's just analyzing population rates of these things since they've been tracked, largely since the industrial era. You mentioned okay. childhood mortality and how we study that and how we know how they've changed not only in the last couple hundred years, but a uh, sense of what the rates were across human history. You want to talk about that and maybe incorporate what we know about this enlightenment revolution as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a big topic and it's, a, you know, it's important and interesting. I think there's a paper by um, Vulcan Atkinson um, in Evolution and Human Behavior, and they use a phrase that really stuck with me. Um, they use the phrase, you know, the reduction in child mortality and infant and child mortality in, in many places in the world. And I say that very deliberately because there are places in the world where it's still very high, sadly, um, are among the greatest achievements of mankind. Um, and I think that's that's well put. You know, I think it's... Uh, we cannot peek into the past, but we can look at convergent sources of evidence to triangulate. And so triangulation in this context means that we're using different methods to try to answer the same question. And if different methods give us a similar answer in this case, 
child and inf infant and child mortality were much higher in the past than they are in contemporary societies in most places on, on earth. Um, they do give us a similar answer. Uh, and, 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 and so, um, I think we can say with, with, with a lot of confidence that that's the case. Um, I already mentioned that people use kind of bioarchaeological evidence. <laughs> People have used uh, what's happened over the past 200 years where there is much better documentation, uh, sometimes written documentation, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, other forms of documentation. There's also um, demographic modeling that people are doing. And so what they're doing there is they're saying, we know that for most of human history, there was basically the population didn't grow. There was no population growth. And then only towards the very end, there's been this exponential increase in, you know, the, the human population. And based on kind of bioarchaeological, physiological evidence, the estimates are that fertility rates were about, on average, women would have sort of, you know, six to seven children um, for much of evolutionary history. People have said this based on remains found of, of, of women. And so... If you have six or seven offspring and mortality rates are low, you're very quickly going to get a population explosion, which didn't occur for most of human evolutionary history. So then there's the question, what kept population growth in check? And there are different possibilities. One possibility was that, you know, infant and child mortality rates were high throughout human evolutionary history. Another was that they weren't high, but that there were occasionally major diseases, for example, which led to a population collapse. And that's why if you really zoom out, you don't see population growth. But if you would zoom in, you would see kind of boom and bust cycles. And so there are different possible scenarios. And um, Mike Gervin and, 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 um, and his colleagues have analyzed this with pop, you know, demographic data. And they, they think that the most probable scenario is that the, the, the infinite child mortality rates uh, were, were con sort of consistently high with, of course, there being some variation, but uh, that it's more likely that that's the explanation than some of these other options. I distinguish between infant and child mortality. Let me just make that explicit. Um, people often say, it, you know, infant mortality kind of refers to um, the uh, proportion of live births that, uh, that dies. Okay, so it's important as these are live births. What, what proportion, um, uh, what's the chance if you're born alive in a particular time and place um, that you survive to the first year, through the first year? And, and then child mortality refers to that same thing, live birth, and then surviving up to the age of 15. Typically, that's the benchmark that I've seen used. And, and so infant mortality is subsumed under child mortality in this definition. And so infant mortality is always going to be lower. Because if you died as an infant, you also died as a child, basically under these definitions. And so people like Vol Vulcan Atkinson, um, but also our world in data and, the, and, the, and kind of the human mortality database um, by, that's at Berkeley, they, they sort of estimate that if you, you know, that across human evolution, on average, if you were born alive, the probability that you would make it through the first year is sort of on the order of, um, you know, uh, tw sort of 25%. And the probability of making it to the age of 15 is a little better than a coin flip. Okay. Now let that sink in. I mean, when I saw that statistic the first time, you know, it really moved me in a way. Like the idea that, you know, our ancestors, all those, you know, people in the past, um, that if you were born alive, the odds that you would make it to the age of 15 were, um, you know, a, a bit better than 50%, but not much better. And so, you know, that, and that, that, and the, the main source of mortality in the past is disease. That's also something that all these different, you know, people who are studying this seem to agree on. And so, but the exact percentages is going to also vary across space and time, but people talk about percentages on the order of 70 to 80% of those deaths were due to disease. And then, you know, there was also, uh, there were the other deaths, deaths were mainly through um, exposure to, to violence, for example, or, uh, and violence can include not just like other groups being violent, but actually also infanticide is something that occurred with some regularity 
uh, in the past and still happens with some regularity um, in, in some in some places. Um, and what's maybe surprising for some people who are kind of in the evolutionary psychology literature, um, I was a bit surprised to see this, but the estimates are that actually death by predation for infants and children, that that was actually um, fairly low. So of course these things did happen, um, but they were not, you know, as big a source of, of mortality as, as maybe my intuition was before I saw these statistics. Um, also, if you look at non-human primates, where you also see infanticide occurring, but you also see death by predation there, death by predation is actually uh, much more common in many non-human primates. So for example, in some non-human primates, the odds that an infant will be killed by a predator might be on the order of 30 or 40 or even 50%. Uh, and, and, and the humans, the estimates are much lower than that, like more on the order of a few percent. Uh, yeah. I was speaking with a cultural anthropologist named Jack Schultz recently, and he was talking about how across cultures, especially in hunter-gatherer societies where infant mortality rates remain high, sometimes they're not even considered human until like a year or two or later. So the idea is if it's, if the baby doesn't survive, say past the first year, there's not the same grieving process as if it was a full-fledged human who died. It's some, some cultures view this as something like the baby returned to the spirit realm, but it was never actually a human. And I was, I was wondering if, is that some sort of psychological cultural adaptation to having to deal with adversity on this massive scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's work by David Lancey who has studied, um, infanticide in, 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 in detail in, in different, you know, places and, and sort of some integrated work from different anthropologists, uh, on this topic. And my sense, um, is that it is the case that also in those places where infanticide is, and sorry, sorry, infant mortality is um, more common, people do also very seriously grieve. And so, so they do also find it extremely difficult. And so in David Lancey's work, you know, he has excerpts from anthropologists who have worked um, in different places over the past 50 to 100 years. And, 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 and then you'll, you know, the descriptions are heartbreaking when you read, for instance, like women saying, you know, um, I was undernourished and then I had two children. I had twins, but I could only feed one. I didn't have enough, you know, milk or energy to feed two children. And so I had to choose, but it's really like, it was, you know, extremely difficult. Um, so, so with that part of what you said, that's not at least the way that I've been, what I've been reading uh, on this, but with the other part that you've said that it is the case that there are these um, you know, cultural sort of beliefs and practices around infant mortality um, that I think do help people maybe cope or at least that are kind of adjusted to the facts, you know, the harsh reality of many children um, dying. And so you mentioned um, this, uh, this belief that, for instance, um, in the first months of life, the infant um, is still kind of drifting in between um, you know, the earthly world and the spirit world, and it might still drift back to the spirit world, which would mean that it would pass away or it might, you know, survive and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, stay at the earthly world. And so, I, yes, I definitely, um, have read different accounts of ways in which cultures have organized, um, their, their beliefs and practices around the harsh reality of high infant mortality. And, um, one of those practices too, is like, when do you give a child a name? There are some cultures where a child is not given a name until they've passed a certain age. And maybe that's also in part because of this, you know, um, caution in some sense that, uh, it may or may not survive. So that's a very interesting part of anthropology. And, and, you know, in this podcast, there's a lot of focus on kind of interdisciplinary work, I think, and that's very, very nice. And I think this is really an area where interdisciplinary work has a lot of added value. So when we as, you know, psychologists are trying to think about developmental adaptation to different conditions, including harsh conditions, um, it's, it's very informative to think about what have these anthropologists learned about um, these different 
you know, contemporary societies and what have historians and, and archaeologists inferred about these past societies and in which ways are cultures kind of potentially, you know, designed around their harsh reality. So it's, this is bridging, you know, history, archaeology, culture, um, psychology, evolutionary biology, and it's giving such a rich view and, and you know, rather than having any particular stake in any particular empirical claim in my sort of uh, work, what I would love to achieve is that there would be more synergy between these different areas. And, and, and in particular, I would like to, you know, bring some of this evolutionary biology and this anthropology and history to people doing psychology or asking questions um, uh, about adaptation, because if we're talking about adaptation, we are talking also about uh, the ways that our minds have, you know, have evolved and, and then, you know, these other topics become very relevant. So what I'm hoping for is, is, is more synergy between these uh, fields. I was reading about in the last couple hundred thousand years, there was at one point an extreme bottleneck on the human population where it was estimated that our whole population globally might have been down to something like 1500. And if that's true, then it's not. Well, obviously there would be extreme adversity for those surviving members. Like that presumes that human population was once much higher and everyone who survived had to watch most of their family and the people they were around perish. So do you think that that, if that bottleneck could above and beyond most of the adaptations we're talking about lead to some sort of selection effect where only the people who were the toughest were the ones to survive and pass their genes on and that we might have a special relationship with grief or adversity because of this history? You know, that's a fascinating question that I've honestly never, I have heard about this bottleneck, but I've never thought about its implications for the evolution of our minds. So it's wonderful that you raise this. And so I don't have sort of a, a well thought out um, response. One thought that, uh, that did occur to me when you mentioned, you know, when you raised this question is it could also be the, that it's those people who are, for example, you know, and, and now I'm really speculating. So just to make sure that, you know, the people who are listening to realize that I'm now not talking about something that I know, but just something that, you know, is, is, a, is a question that we might reflect on it. Um, you could also imagine that those people who are able to build collaboration under these extreme, extremely adverse conditions that those people we were able to do that kind of in a, in a fast and kind of, you know, uh, uh, flexible way uh, that, that, that those people um, were more, more likely to make it through. I mean, it depends on which character, what were the characteristics of the individuals that did make it? Was it random? Was it that they had very good immune systems, that they were nutritionally in a good state? Was it um, that they were able to cooperate more effectively? Was it that they were able to deal with threats in a better way. So it could be many different characteristics. Um, and uh, and I, I've never thought about, about this question in, in more detail, but it would be interesting to, to think about, um, about it. Yeah. Another population level evolutionary fact may or may not connect to your work is that we have twice as many female ancestors as males. So you, you mentioned that over the course of human history, a woman on average would have six or seven children and Maybe only a small percentage of those would survive, but it's not necessarily that there was a man paired to them that was also having six or seven children. It, it could be that, well, one extreme would be half would have zero and half would have double the amount. And in reality, there was probably some whole distribution, but a very skewed distribution on the male end where people at the highest levels of male reproductive success have many more and many men have no offspring enough that there are twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So the context in which I think about, about sort of related um, questions, and this ties in also with questions about like risk taking and, and sort of, you know, topics of like impulsivity and future orientation uh, is how are resources distributed in the environment? And, and so um, if you take, you know, elephant seals, for example, there, there is high reproductive variance and high reproductive skew among the males. And I, um, 
I remember, you know, when I was doing my PhD at UCLA, we would drive up north along the coast of California with the graduate students, some of the professors, and we would go watch the elephant seals and the males would then be competing, you know, for, for the beaches. And those males that successfully um, uh, acquire a beach, they become, uh, and now I'm going to use some terminology that doesn't sound like formal terminology, but it actually is used in the textbooks. They become beach masters. And so they have high reproductive success. Um, and, you know, they, they, they have to really fight hard to become a beach master. And, and sometimes men, males get very injured or even, you know, might die. Um, and, and so in that, you know, species, the males are about three times physically larger than the females. So large that sometimes, you know, not very often, but occasionally during a mating, a female might actually uh, die because the male is so heavy. Uh, that she basically, you know, is 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 is, is, uh, is, is collapsing under the weight of the male, um, and so these males, uh, you know, they fight hard, and you know, if 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 resources are are so skewed in that either you sort of own a whole beach with all the reproductive potential, or you know, you have to kind of leave the beach and you have no reproduction, right? Then you would expect also natural selection for these, you know, traits to to kind of fight fight for for this high um uh, uh this high benefit and um and so you can see that sort of at, at selection at the population at the species level but one idea is that also we have phenotypic plasticity in this adjustment of how how hard do we want to compete for things in our environment you know so for example if i'm in a world where i believe that desirable resources whether they be material or reproductive that whether if those are those are somewhat uniformly distributed, fighting for the top, you know, becomes less rewarding than in an environment where the winner takes all. Right, and so, um, and so, so people have linked this to 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 why in some environments there might what, what in some environments there might be more risk taking in in environments where resources are more uh, unequal. There might be more risk taking, um, and so, so people have who have made this link, and uh, you know, I've this is a very, I think this is also a complicated area, just like the one about reproductive development. Um, the theory is, you know, the theories can be very nuanced if you formalize them, and we are formalizing them. You mentioned the Max Planck Institute where I work um, for one day a week, and the other four days in Amsterdam at the Max Planck Institute, we work um, with a, a, a PhD. Uh, who is, his name is Benoit de Courson, and he's modeling also selection on risk-taking behavior. When would you expect, you know? And um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a complicated topic. But anyway, now I'm not going to say something about those models for the moment, but about whether, you know, risk-taking should be favored. Risk-taking is sometimes defined as, uh, you know, a, a behavior that has high variance, higher variance in, in outcomes. And... Um, you know, if resources are very unequally distributed, there's a winner takes all uh, situation and you don't currently have those resources, then, you know, taking a risk could be for you, could, could have the most utility in some sense, because uh, if you, if you don't succeed with your risk taking, um, you're in a worse state, but not that much worse than you are currently. And if you do succeed, you're in a much better state than you are currently. And so the benefit of success is very large. Um, relative to um, uh, the, um, the you know the 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 down the downside um, the potential downside, yeah. So this is not really exactly answering your question, um, but I do think it's interesting to make a link with um, how resources are distributed in the environment. And so people have argued that this is why in more unequal societies, um, many types of of crime, but also things like homicide. Um, are more prevalent. Uh, this is also a very lively debate in the social sciences, um, where many people are exploring alternative vaccinations. But the work, for example, by Martin Daly and others, to me, does seem to suggest that you know inequality of resources in societies does predict um, even sometimes more so than kind of absolute resources, um, the extent to which people are willing to compete for those resources. In the modeling world, many, many traits 
are normally distributed where you have some average and that's the most common. And then the further you stray from that average, relatively symmetric, the fewer people have that combination of traits. So this could even work through like natural statistics. Like if you flip a coin a bunch of times on average, it'll cancel out. You'll get roughly equal number of heads or tails. And the further out you go into the tails, the more unlikely it is that you get a large, large number of only one outcome. Uh, but then also in the modeling world for things like reproductive success or for things like wealth inequality or percent of crimes committed relative to a percent of the population, they're all Pareto distributed where a small number of the population is accounts for most of the data points. And it, th this doesn't even happen just with behavior. You see it with populations, like a small number of cities have most of the population, a small number of stars have most of the mass. What is it about these natural law-like dynamics that you see these distributions popping up everywhere? Ooh, that's a deep question. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that one. Um, not because I don't okay. think it's a great question. I do think it's a great question. I just don't think I'm the right person um, to engage with the question. Okay, let's not comment that on the metaphysics of, you know, where do the laws come from and why do they pop up in, in disparate fields, but specifically on this Pareto distributed question about unequal distribution of resources or distribution of behavioral traits, again, whether that's something like criminality or uh, reproductive success or even number of matches on dating apps or Pareto distributed. Uh, what are, it's, it's, on one hand, it's unequal, so that sort of implies random, but it's predictably unequal. It's not necessarily the same small percentage of the population, but it's always a relatively small percentage of the population. I've heard similar evolutionary game theory arguments for something like the population rates of psychopaths, where if you have too many exploiters, obviously that's unstable for a population, but if you have too few, I'm putting that in quotes, then there's sort of this open niche of resources ripe for the taking. And it would be not positive, but adaptive for some small percentage of the population to become exploiters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so one process that is, um, occurring in the models of Benoit de Courson, whose work I just mentioned, um, and, and he, the term that people use for this is uh, hysteresis. And hysteresis is um, where, you know, the, 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 I'm not sure what the formal definition is, but it's, it's that the state of a population currently is not explained by its, its sort of current environment, um, but it's explained by, by its history. Um, and so one of the things that he sees in, in his models is that, um, you know, if the world is such that uh, that many people are below sort of a, a desperation threshold, think about a bird that needs to make it through the night. You know, if it doesn't eat, it's going to not survive the night. And so it's below its threshold of need. So now it's willing to maybe forage in a more risky patch, right? Because if it doesn't, it's going to die. So it needs to take a risk in order to even have a chance of surviving. So people who are below a desperation threshold um, you know, there's an analogy with, with, with what their current circumstances might be. Like they're currently in a really difficult spot and they basically have to take, if they don't take a risk, they're unlikely to jump above the desperation threshold. And so what they might, that, what that might involve also is sometimes taking resources from other people. You know, that's, that's high risk because the outcome could be quite bad. So they might get hurt. They might go to jail, but if they are successful, then they do end up above the desperation threshold and they are then able to you know, pay the rent or maybe, you know, buy drugs or, you know, feed their children. There are very different reasons for why people um, need to be above this threshold. And so in a world where there are many people who are in that state below the desperation threshold, for those people who are above the threshold, you know, they prefer to not be exploited, right? They prefer their resources not be taken. So they might engage in sort of, you know, toughness signals. To, to avoid that they are the ones whose resources will get taken. And so, um, you know, 
what can then happen is that basically everybody starts showing these toughness behaviors. Uh, even many people who are above the desperation threshold in order to not get exploited by the people who are below the desperation threshold, the subset of those people are choosing to engage in these exploitative behaviors because that's their only way of getting above the threshold, at least in their perception. And so what can happen in these models is that at some point you have a population where everybody's engaging in these toughness behaviors because they're worried about being exploited. And now the external environment actually improves, like the number of resources in the environment increases. And there's a much smaller percentage of the population that's actually below the desperation threshold. Such a small population that if that was the initial state, the individuals above the threshold would not engage in these toughness behaviors because the chance that they would be exploited would be so low because there are so few people who are below the, the threshold, right? But now everybody's showing this toughness behavior. And then even if resources increase, individuals, you know, keep showing this toughness behavior. And so there might be neighborhoods that, you know, used to be violent because there weren't enough resources. Now there are enough resources, but the violence still sort of, you know, endures for longer uh, than you would expect if you were to only look at the resources based on history of the population. So this, I imagine, Willem, could be a indirect answer to a question you might get about, you know, why do we care about all these evolutionary theories or why do we care about the mating behavior of elephant seals when there are real human problems in the world? And then your work at Max Planck connects to all of this in that these evolutionary predictions and even cross-species comparisons do bear on real-world human problems, like with criminality or violence and so on. Yes, they do. And I, I think one of the things that they also do for me, uh, and this is, you mentioned at the very beginning, you mentioned sort of like the reasonable, you know, responses that people might have. Reasonable does not mean good. Reasonable means understandable given the individual circumstances, given the statistical structure of their environment, you know, whether it's predictable or unpredictable, as we also discussed, that can mean different things, but, you know, what their environment is like, um, what the reward structure is of their environment. And so there has been a history in psychology and there still is in many quarters of pathologizing, um, basically, you know, uh, psychological ways of relating to the world or behaviors that are very common in human populations, you know? So people will, will call things like, um, you know, people who prefer immediate rewards over future rewards that, that people will describe that as, you know, the inability to delay gratification or like a lack of foresight or, you know, an impaired, um, impaired, uh, future orientation or, you know, people use terms like this and those are very normative, right? But there are many people who, for very good reasons, are focused on the present. They are pursuing a strategy that other people in their circumstances would also very likely pursue. And, and so in those cases, I think taking this kind of evolutionary perspective, even though the perspective is not about, you know, what's good or bad, it's just about how do people respond to their conditions. Um, I do think it, it can sort of uh, reduce some of the pathologizing of, um, of responses that, uh, that do not result from pathology, but that result from people growing up in systems and structures, you know, um, that basically create for them, um, very few options other than pursuing this particular, um, strategy. And, and so to me, taking that approach, if somebody is, for example, very oriented towards meeting their immediate needs, um, because that's what they have to do to feed their children. To me, seeing that as a reasonable response to their conditions is very respectful. It's saying, you know, th this is, you know, you are unfortunately in these very difficult conditions and they force you to, you know, they, they make it very difficult for you to do anything other than pursuing this short-term oriented strategy. But that you're pursuing that strategy is not a pathology. It's not something that's wrong with you. It's not something that needs to be fixed in you. It's a response that you have in this condition that I would also have in this condition probably. And if society thinks, which is, you know, again, not what a scientist decides, but if society thinks that those responses um, are undesirable, then society should change the environment, should help to improve the conditions of, of people who are more likely to show those, those responses, rather than kind of situating the problem in the individual and telling the individual to change the emphasis should be on how can we change the conditions of the individual 
so that the individual's responses will be different from what they have been. I think that's a great optimistic place we can wrap up. Is there anything of your work, either past or ongoing or future, that we haven't discussed that you'd like to mention before we close? Well, so building on what I just talked about with the reasonable responses and then tying it in back with what we talked about earlier, like these hidden talents, these cognitive abilities that are also, you know, tailored to solving challenges that are more common in adverse conditions. Um, there too, the, you know, at least in the past, I think, I, I think it's happening a little bit less now, but the discourse has been um, very normative. You know, and it's been, it, it, and there are, there are titles in scientific journals, leading scientific journals that are, that are really, um, you know, emphasizing sort of the deficits inside these, the, the individual, um, uh, that are, uh, and, and I, I, I know that when those things are written, um, the intent is not to put the blame necessarily in the individual by the authors. Um, but I do think as psychologists, we, we really need to reflect on how we write and think about um, people growing up in conditions of adversity and um, how we think and write about people in those conditions um, influences not just how the scientific community, um, you know, is, is talking about people in those conditions, but it's also influencing how those people might view themselves, how um, you know, practitioners and social workers, um, you know, might be used to thinking about them. And so I, I think it can be really eye-opening and, 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 and good to take a broader perspective where we, um, you know, first of all, acknowledge that people growing up in adverse conditions have, have, are in a really difficult situation. And we, uh, as a society, as a whole, you know, owe it to help reduce their, their suffering. And then in trying to do that, I think it's not helpful to primarily or only focus on struggles and, 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 and impairments in the way that the literature has done. I think, you know, in some cases, those things exist. It depends on the kind of things that people are experiencing, but toxic stress can really occur and can damage, in some cases, uh, people's functioning. But people also develop strategies and they also develop skills. And I think if we take an approach where we incorporate both of those things, it's good for science because we get a more well-rounded view of, of, of these individuals. And I think it's also good for how these individuals view themselves. If you're approached by a scientist who is, you know, going to establish, you know, working with the prior that they're going to establish deficits in your functioning um, by giving you, you know, tests that you're going to perform worse on, that's a different way of being approached than being approached by a scientist who is interested in getting a well-rounded view of your functioning. And that might include also some tests where you score lower, but it might also include tests where the scientist thinks that you actually might do quite well. And, um, and then also lets you know that you've done, you know, a good, you know, that you've done well. So I'm not sure I'm expressing myself in the best possible way, but I just wanted to highlight a commonality between sort of highlighting these strengths. Uh, and highlighting these strategies and how together this gives us a more well-rounded view. And, and that's something that I hope people take away, whatever the empirical answers are to specific questions. Thank you, Willem. I love how interdisciplinary your work is and, and that it has both this theoretical and practical importance. Thank you. It was really great to be here. It was a wonderful, free-flowing conversation. And um, I look forward to uh, to keeping the connection.